but a kind of uh, gestalt that's created between them, a creative creativity. Um, but as you're making the distinction in different media, and where does that cause each to go to separate rooms, and where do they stay in the same room and, and work together? And Susan and Charles are a very good example of, as we saw, of intimacy in the act of creation between them. They are a husband and wife who do not get jealous of one another. Uh, we have others, de Kooning, uh, various other examples of husbands and wives who divorce because the wife becomes too prominent and the husband doesn't want her sharing the light. Or the wife decides to become yeah. prominent and <laughs> she departs. And we have too many stories like that, of all of which too much attention is given. I think that it's very fascinating to give attention um, as is being given in a subtle way by these three exhibitions in the last couple of years, and then I hope by my little interview here, um, to wives and husbands who are very happy to collaborate and find uh, creativity in this process. The other collaboration that we saw there in the introduction is Christo and Jean-Claude. Now Jean-Claude never shared the limelight with Christo in all of his projects until the past years because she was kind of the marketing agent, which she primarily is now. But now he attributes a lot of the design process, kind of the way Charles and, and Susan were talking about how they share what's going to go where and you know how he was sort of leaping in and, and showing us what happened when the book was actually being created. And I've met Christo and Jean-Claude, and, and certainly she's very vibrant and very active and uh, you know, more than a muse, like a life force for Christo, who is very quiet and, and retiring and probably prefers to be in his studio doing the drawing. Um, so it's, it's wonderful that this generous collaboration could be made a public statement now. And I think it shows a new, it's not feminism, it's not a, a kind of freedom in the arts. It just seems a, an, an, another consciousness of spirit about well, she, uh, the artistic process itself she, among she uh, men speaks. and women. She speaks of it as that her uh, collaboration is that she finishes his sentences. <laughs> <laughs> well, she probably also really needs to take credit for finishing his exhibitions because it would appear that none of these installations would really take place without Jean-Claude um, because of the obstacles that um, comes forth. There's, w there's just one thought that I would like uh, as an observation in relation to uh, all of the work that they've done that the last piece, which is the gates, has to do with totally with the human scale, where the others, the, the human scale was always subordinate to it, but here it wasn't. Well, each had a different purpose, some being more abstract than others, which is a point that you're making, and this one did generate community. And it, it generated color and light in well, it was a the very time great of year when it was season, and it was set to do that, and it caused an extraordinary number of international internationals to visit New York. This also has arisen because organically, I have been in a collaboration with a very old uh, dear friend who is publishing a book as of next Sunday, in which I will have the, the interpretive essay about the work um, of haiku, of poems and photographs that were done over as a discipline over the space of one year, because actually she's a sculptress. Um, and she was inspired by the New York State Poet Laureate on the radio going up to New Hampshire to write a poem a day. And also by reading Lisa Dalby's um, fiction about the granddaughter of Lady of Mur Murasaki, The Tale of Ganji. So I've written an interpretive essay uh, which speaks about inspiration, the muse and collaboration, and about the history of haiku and the, the Zen monks and, and how through time there have been different adaptations of the poetry and what the poems meant for her as a sculptress and how you're shaping words, and this goes back to Charles in your question, shaping words can be like bringing meaning out of sculpture. And if the language poet is, is, is anything, it's, it's kind of about that. It's moving into where painters became interested in the materials and how they spoke to them, not only in what they were representing uh, in the other world. So it's to celebrate that. And the book is called Taking Aim at Myself. And um, Josie Campbell Dellenbaugh is the author of it. And Beachwood Productions um, 
in uh, Chatham, New Jersey is, is, uh, is the publisher, and an art, a printer in New Hampshire who does a lot of the art books for the Wildenstein in New York and so forth is doing the printing. And I expect it's going to be a beautiful product. So that's something to celebrate um, this spring along with um, the first grandchild first grandchild arriving. What other collaborations was I thinking of when I introduced this program? Well, something that Susan wasn't able to mention is that she admires um, William Blake. So they're not only those who collaborate with others, but are multi-talented in themselves and devote or allow a certain part of their voice to express itself differently, sort of like Josie being a sculptress, allowing herself to write poetry and painting and and doing photography and what she learns from that. And William Blake is certainly one of our great examples, and he's an inspiration actually for Susan B, um, where he painted, um, and he etched, and we remember him for his poetry, of course, but he did all three of them successfully. Sansa, the um, composer, for which our audience remembers um, the animals, the Carnival of the Animals is one of his most famous and one of his most pleasurable, where each animal speaks during the, the piece. Uh, was a very gifted poet and playwright, and we've often seen some of his scores in opera. Um, William Turner spent his life writing a poem which was never published <laughs> and never finished, which he regarded as his most important work. What do we remember Turner for? His extraordinary landscapes extraordinary seascapes, his extraordinary color. And what he did, it's called the fallacies of hope, is that he took little quotations from his poem. He took the best lines here and there, and he titled his paintings after them. So he learned something from the process, but he discovered that that was not his métier in terms of his, his, his way of expressing himself. And Josie, after writing this, is not going to become a poet, but she indeed explored the act of being a poet and finding the poet in herself and just won a uh, Best in the Show Sculpture Award uh, in the Hudson River Valley uh, up near Storm King um, and received $1,000 for it. She was just more excited because she was the best in the show. <laughs> and it's for a wonderful um, sculpture called the Piata, which was uh, inspired by um, Somalia. And I said that it was extraordinary good timing because we also have Darfur and Sudan, so we're seeing many of the images in the media as well. So um, that probably ended into part of it. Who else? Mark Strand recently. Do you know Mark Strand's poetry? No. Mark I Strand don't. was one of my teachers at Breadloaf a long time ago. We haven't heard too much from him. But now, recently, he was in New York, and he wrote a piece that the New York Symphony performed. In other words, they took one of his poems, and they made a piece and performed it. And he wanted to be a painter very badly. And what he's done is that he wrote one volume of poems about um, Hopper's paintings. And he took each of Hopper's paintings and he wrote a prose poem about it, which is something different than what Susan and Charles are doing. Um, Paul Ouster, who writes novels, also writes poetry, um, had his poems set to music. There was a uh, competition sponsored uh, by the Guggenheim um, Museum. and. Uh, Five or six composers took different poems. What amazed me as I went to that particular presentation of those poems set to music is that three of the composers chose the same poem, which cho showed the musicality in the language of those particular poems. And Gertrude Stein is probably um, credited with being the source of a lot of this, especially for Charles, because Gertrude Stein is the mama of the <laughs> language poets. And Gertrude Stein's quote, I write with my eyes, because, of course, she had all of the painters in her house and collected their paintings, but she was a writer. And she tried, as did Virginia Woolf, to paint with her writing, but neither of them actually succeeding um, no because level. there are boundaries. Yeah. And we're going to have boundaries in time, so we certainly don't want to miss um, our next segment, which is in honor of Mother's Day, so I think we better go there. Okay. And then we'll have a few minutes to talk afterwards. So to Georgia and to uh, Uzbekistan, yes. actually to New York for a delegation from Uzbekistan, Beijing plus 10, um, a delegation from uh, Samarkand, Uzbekistan, one of my former graduate students who was, came as the delegate. And um, uh, their issue is with social economic development for women and um, against violence with women and counseling in villages. And then to Georgia where high risk uh, child protection is the issue. So 
Um, this is about two, six minutes long. Right. So, so our audience will can know. Can you give the cue for us yes. and our can viewers we have to the be next able step. to? Uh, there we go. And in 2001, uh, first and first time, we implemented the microland uh, program for our microfinance. microfinance program for our rural women, women in rural areas. And on today's day, we have helped with microfinance for 4,000 women. And uh, as for present, that we uh, assist for 4,000 women in Russia. 4,000 women. And what are the primary activities? Microfinance. Microfinance. To help them with small, small business then? Yes. And what are some of the small businesses that are created? Okay. It's a handicraft. Handcraft. It's a agriculture. Uh, like uh, cooking or producing uh, confectionaries with this. And small business like trading. But now we are planning to work with our social program. Uh, like social and microfinance. So, social and microfinance. Like uh, render psychological, emotional, medical and juridical support. For women in the rural areas. So more intensive because care, we have, though. We have, mm -hmm. yes, women. And so would that require new staffings, or do you have the kind of expertise that you require in terms of this uh, activity? We work with our staff, and we have uh, two uh, different staff and experts and consultants. We work with our staff, and we have two out expert, expert uh, from outside, and you saw him? Yes. Now, you mentioned participating in this NIS workshop on mm -hmm. Saturday, mm -hmm. and that this was about organizational activities. Is there any benefit that you see in terms of what you will do with Sabra when you return to Uzbekistan? No, we, we, в общем-то там говорилось о, значит, том, что киргизское и казахское правительство ННО они сделали мониторинг. I guess we've lost our audio on this. This is uh, Georgia and it's high-risk child protection. 
and this is the uh, director of the uh, Guram Shavili Clinic. And she's talking to the UNICEF monitoring team in which I participated, um, though I'm taking the picture. And this lady is a doctor, and she's talking about orphanages, and these are some of um, the uh, workers, uh, also physicians with the high-risk children and children who are crippled in this hospital. This is one of the only successful clinics that has been monitored. These are some of the children that have uh, disabilities. And on this team, uh, the lady you saw with the long ponytail is the director of UNICEF, Maya Kivshishidza, and um, these children all have some kind of form of disabilities. And until this clinic was opened, uh, we had no uh, care in the country. There is Nancy Archer, who is the representative of Child Protection for World Vi uh, Vision and, was, and is also the uh, wife of the UN representative and is now an advisor to Georgia and they're staying on there for another year and I will see her this summer to um, hear the update. There's another child, puppy, uh, in need of a care uh, <laughs> in the landscape and this is a wonderful woman, Maya Kipkiza, also who uh, played a direct role in World Vision and in Every Child. So these are NGOs working and this is an adopted mother. 90% um, of the children in Georgia are institutionalized and come from homes because there's absolute poverty there and they can't take the children. So the children that are at high risk are the children um, who have disabilities because, of course, those are the least likely uh, ones for people to take. Now, this is last instance was of a, a family that, because they received funds, were able to keep their child because they would be able to have some kind of medication uh, for their children. Um, so in these two segments, we've seen two organizations, one that went to um, be represented at Beijing Plus 10, which is Mirabhan Abdullayev and Mav uh, Ludakan Shiranova, the director of SABR, which is called the Social Economic Development Center. What is interesting for our viewers is that the microfinance program, which has come about that is serving between 10 and 4,000 people, is a little difficult to understand uh, because of the translation, was started by Hillary Clinton when Hillary Clinton was the president's wife in 1985 for the Beijing conference, because it's Beijing plus 10, 2005, um, she as the president's wife gave a uh, talk and as a lawyer on microfinancing for women. And that's the program that these women took back um, to Uzbekistan and Im implemented. So they speak very highly of her. She also, Hillary Clinton, also came out to visit them in Samarkand. In fact, she was there the spring before I was there in August on my Fulbright, and they were still very excited about having uh, her visit. Madeleine Albright also visited their center uh, in Samarkand, Sabar. So they're on the map and they have survived uh, the militancy which has um, risen and the lack of secure environment which has risen in Uzbekistan in the last year. Uh, and I participated in a uh, forum at OSI, Soros Foundation in New York on this subject a month ago because I was concerned about uh, having spent my time there as a Fulbright in the programs I know that are implemented. And uh, it was the director of human rights and legal rights in Uzbekistan. And the situation there is not very um, healthy uh, in that there is a considerable migration, which indicates its lack of health because people who are able to leave are starting to migrate to Moscow or other places. Um, Going back to Georgia, we went there and to uh, Uzbekistan looking at the welfare of women and children in honor of our American Mother's Day. Um, and to end on a happy note, um, if our technical staff can cooperate, I brought along a, a kind of um, lute which is played um, in Georgia. It's handmade. It's still played oftentimes in the mountains. And I thought it would be nice to hear. Um, there we go. Can we have the audio a little higher? Um, it would be nice to bring a little bit of the good cheer of Georgia um, to Americans. <laughs> what are those uh, objects, those vertical, like salt and pepper? the statues. Oh, these are representatives of the king and queens of Georgia. Is that what you're asking? Yeah, if we could turn off the No, 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 sound. let's hear it. Okay, do you want to hear that? Yeah. Let's wait. We have five minutes. See the 
cross. We've got about four minutes. How can you tell them to stop it? Okay. Yeah, let's, uh, that, thank you. Okay. You so, you asked your question about these statues. Um, these were a gift uh, from Prince uh, Alain and Veronica Marat, uh, who make a part-time residency in Tbilisi. In fact, you saw Alain walking um, as we were entering the child protection area, and he and his wife work considerably in private philanthropy with the Child Protection Act there. And it's of a, a Georgian and a king and queen. Uh, uh, from Abkhazia, actually, from Zugdidi, uh, from um, the part of the world which, uh, Ajara, which caused quite a bit of trouble when Georgia was open. And then these cups are um, drinking cups, and they're also from that part of the world. And uh, Paul Meyer, remember when I interviewed him yeah. last spring, had just been in Georgia, and he had the experience with the men of, of drinking these, and the wine is put in and then up like this. Um, when I first saw those, I thought they were sort of uh, musical instruments, and I was yes, trying to figure out how they... But in Georgia, everything is adapted to wine, and then uh, Paul also experienced drinking um, the wine from these. And the, the men wine, actually yeah. at festivals do this, and they have two of them, and they cross their arms, and then each of them drink, uh, showing a kind of bonding of brotherhood. Um, and I thought I hadn't shared these before that I would bring them. And these are nice examples. They have the bird. Um, they're from the Caucasus. Um, you will find them in Russia, too, because the Caucasus have always been popular with the Russians for hunting and uh, for their pleasures um, before this political time in which um, Russia and Georgia are not too happy with one another. Um, but those are some of the, the pleasures of the region. So I hope um, that today um, we have enjoyed our Mother's Day holiday in America. It was an extraordinarily beautiful day I spent at the Morris Arboretum and um, congratulated my friends who are for the first time grandparents. Um, and I'm a, uh, what is it, a godmother and grandmother for the first time. Um, so that's <laughs> exciting. And um, all of those who have had children for the first time, uh, which they were in abundance at the Morris Arboretum. And to remember children in other countries um, where there's absolute poverty and families have to give up their children and where children do not have uh, the opportunities um, that all children in America we would like to think at least have here. Um, and hopefully by visiting um, the efforts of these courageous women from Uzbekistan and in Georgia we've had some insight into that. And then to appreciate poetry and art even more um, and to look at when husbands and wives are cooperating and instead of being rivalrous and celebrating one another in their art forms and where the boundaries um, are kept and where the boundaries intersect, uh, not only with husbands and wives, but with professional um, professionals and how each person grows by exploring their many talents in art, music, poetry, um, and a love of nature and of um, children and one another. Um, and there we are, instead of there and here, here and there, <laughs> <laughs> right? And, and uh, now, in this moment. Um, the only other announcement I have is that I had a little publication in Asian Art um, April issue uh, on the Himalayan exhibit. There's a new Himalayan room, which I think I announced last time at the uh, Philadelphia Museum of Art, and if there's any room at all, the JMS Gallery in Chestnut Hill Pennsylvania is having an exhibition of my Georgian photographs on July 9th, reception, 4 to 9 p.m., and everyone is invited. It's the JMS Gallery in Chestnut Hill. Um, they have a number, 877-299-9940, uh, um, um, and Or the it's other July is 9th. they could uh, consult their newspaper. Yeah, it should the be. The Philadelphia paper. It probably. should be in the uh, Philadelphia gallery guide, and the reception is on um, Saturday, July 9. And I certainly extend the invitation to our viewers if they have seen Georgia in my programs. Perhaps this will bring it even closer to them. Um, our time is running. Our out. time is it's running, running out. out. Our time is up. I would like to thank you, <laughs> Janet. Janet Roberts has been our guest.
And uh, again, I would like to thank you for tuning in. I'm James Carroll, and good night. NAP Connection originates from the Berks Community Television Studio in Reading, PA, airing live on the fourth Tuesday of the month at 9 p.m. Check your local listings for repeat programming. For more information about the New Arts Program, call 610-683-6440 or write New Arts Program, P.O. Box 82, Kutztown, PA, 19530. Or visit the office and exhibition space at 173 West Main Street, Kutztown. Hours are Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, 1 to 5 p.m., Saturday, 10 to 2 p.m., or by appointment.